now on. And then I remembered that I didn't actually plug in my presentation remote, so now I'm really behind. <laughs> so, hello everyone. Hello. I'm Jason Palantel. Welcome to the end of the day. I know that I'm what's standing between you and a party, so I'll try and make it entertaining and on time. Um, so, I, uh, I don't know really where to wander when this is like this. So, um, my name is Jason Palmetel. I am the Senior Director of Design and Technical Strategy at Isovera, a Drupal development shop outside Boston in Waltham. And uh, it's a long-winded way of saying I mess with everything and am master of none. Um, what I am a little bit smarter about is type. And there's something pretty exciting that I would like to show you today. And we have a few different things that we're going to cover. So I thought I should start by making a map. So this is where we're going. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. Um, we're going to talk about type and typography, and a little bit about how that feeds into and is a part of and amplifies design and communication, um, where laziness gets in the way of intentionality, um, some things that evolve, and some things that are uh, sort of look at where things are now and status of this new idea, and where that might take us in the future. I have no idea if status olum is actually the status of things to come, but that was the closest way I could find a translation on Wikipedia and elsewhere in Latin. And so if anybody knows Latin better than I do, um, come see me afterwards and we can, we can figure it out. So, above all, these days I consider myself a web typographer. Um, and a designer and a developer and a few other things. But this is the part that I'm really focused on and that's what we're going to talk about most today. And in case not all of you have actually studied typography, I thought I would introduce some people to help me out. And by people, I mean actually four-legged furry creatures who are our pets. Um, so on the left there is Tristan. And uh, last winter we adopted his cousin Tilly on the right and I thought they would actually make a really useful way to talk about distinctions and metrics in type. Things like width, or weight, x height, and of course, slant. <laughs> so these are just aspects of type. And as I mentioned in the title, we're talking about variable fonts, and those are different kinds of variation. And since most of the web is words, we really should be thinking about how we present them. Um, the problem is, on the web, the care with which we present these words is often lacking. Or it's starting to get better, but what we really want to think about is the, the tension that we have on the web between different factors of design, readability, performance, quality of the device upon which it's being viewed. So start by thinking about two dragons. That's a bit of a stretch, but it's entertaining, so just give it a shot. These two dragons flying around fighting for control over this landscape. And that landscape is something I think about a lot on my morning walks with Tristan and Tilly. And I think about the quality of written communication over time. And we go back in history and we look at some of these early manuscripts. And this one that we actually got to see in person in a monastery in Florence, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and the reason why they took such great pains to make this thing of such great beauty is because in their mind, they are giving you the word of God. And that's pretty important to them. And it's pretty important to the people reading it. So the typography, the way they have written this communication is directly related to the importance of the message that it conveys. So there's a very direct link between the words, the design, and how that's conveyed to you as a reader. And that carried forward once the advent of the printing press, um, we still had these beautiful illustrated capitals um, moving forward in time to this illustrated edition of Moby Dick from uh, Rockwell Kent. We have these beautiful initial capitals and the illustration up there. Uh, in this book by Keith Houston about the history of the book, we again have beautiful initial capitals, section dividers, and, and uh, initial emphasis and new paragraphs. Other details like this one from Stephen Cole's book, The Anatomy of Type. Look at the Beautiful little ligature connecting the F and the I up top, and this uh, striking initial paragraph design really helping set out the main idea. And of course, one of my favorites, getting proper quotation marks 
So that's something that really adds to the message and really gives a, a, a polished, sophisticated look to it. Um, because really, at its heart, words communicate meaning. The typography can either amplify it or dilute it. It's going to do one or the other. It's never going to be neutral. Despite what people aimed for with Helvetica, it still imparts something. So when things like this get published, it makes me cry a little bit. Because for centuries, we've been improving our written communication. And the web came along. It got hard. People whined a little bit. They got lazy. And we ended up with straight hash marks up and down on websites and on the intro, like uh, lower third graphics on the Today Show, all over the place. It's just straight up lazy. We could have proper quotation marks and elegant typography, but people decided they didn't want to bother. And the fact that this was published on the Atlantic Monthly's website, where, by the way, they do bother to have proper quotation marks and apostrophes, is because whoever's developing the sites that aren't implementing it didn't think to go look for something like the Typography module, which has been out for Drupal um, for close to 10 years. Install that, click a button, you'll have proper quotation marks in all your body copy. It's that simple. So we know that things are out there to preserve the quality of our communication. You can see this gets me worked up a little bit. So I go for another walk, take a few deep breaths, and I start to think, all right, if I want to be intentional about my typography, if I want to think through all of the things that are hallmarks of good typographic design to me, to make an inventory of them, and figure out what things we can and can't do on the web, Spoiler, it's all of them. And then really start to think about what is the implication of making that effort. Because this is about the survival of centuries of work and thinking in improving the quality of our written communication. Because more and more books are being read online, more and more magazines are being consumed that way, news is being published that way. If we're not taking the time to preserve the quality of that written communication, we're losing meaning. We're losing intent. And we're just saying, meh, that's OK. So this is dragon number one. How do we practice typography in this landscape and bring that intentionality? Well, the thing is, the practice of typography in a digital system, and a dynamic one at that, is different. Let's look a little bit at the ways that it's different. There's a lot. So going back to when I first started working on the web, it looked kind of like this. And now this is sort of a simulation of what it looked like, because I cheated and I made the background gray and took the maximum width away and said in Times New Roman. So that was the web all over the world in 1994. And things improved a few years later. And uh, we had remarkable improvements, like we could set the background color to white. We could set a maximum width on things, and we could set it in Arial instead. It's debatable if that's an actual improvement, but uh, come forward a few more years, and we had the advent of variable of I'm sorry, uh, web fonts. And when I say a few, I'm talking a lot because it wasn't until 2009 that we could reliably use web fonts. So this is an example of using Open Sans in this page, and. I'm using 18 different weights and variants um, for a very large number of uh, uh, K of font data being downloaded. So keep that in the back of your mind. But let's think about things that we can do. So this is another sample page that I created. And you can see I've tried to incorporate a lot of these different aspects of good typography, or at least what's good typography to me. Um, so we have a large initial capital, got nice uh, open type features with the uh, ligature between the F and the L, nice quotation marks, We've introduced proper hyphenation, so we get better uh, rag on the right hand side with the type um, section and end marks in there, and a nice intro line for a paragraph following a section break. So I've tried to incorporate a lot of these features in here, and I've tried to do it in a systematic and sustainable way. And we'll get to what that means in a moment. But it also incorporates things of like what we might do on the small screen, where we tailor the size of the different elements. So you'll notice it's a 
two-story initial capital instead of three. The top line heading is smaller, but still very prominent. You still have a very clear sense of hierarchy, but it is tailored for the device upon which it's being viewed. That is responsive design and typography. This is stuff that's well-traveled territory, but if you think back to scene 24, um, sorry, it's my Python joke. Yes. All right, I got one. <laughs> um, 549K or more is an awful lot of font data to be loading, so that's where we run into dragon number two. Dragon number two is performance, and this is what happens when we stop thinking about that during the design process. We run into the wall or the door that the developer has just slammed in our face when we say, we really want you to produce this for us. And they say, no, we're not going to introduce that much data download. It's going to be a terrible experience, and we're not going to do that and incur the cost. It's one of the things that we have to remember as well is until the content is on the user's screen, your design doesn't exist. So let's think about this for a second, or 2.9 seconds. And then when your web fonts finally show up and three second mark hits, here's the dilemma. Every shipping browser has introduced a three second delay that it will not put any content on the screen until that web font loads. So if you're on a higher latency network connection, whether you're on a train, a plane, a mobile device, a desktop where your office Wi-Fi is kind of crappy, doesn't matter. If you hit that three second mark, and there's no web fonts there, how many of you have lost interest? Well, it's not just mobile. Mobile and desktop. This was data that Google just released at their Chrome Dev Days a, a, less than a month ago. Over 50% of your audience will abandon your site if they're waiting around for three seconds. Desktop or mobile, doesn't matter. So do you really want to take that gamble, waiting for all of these web fonts to load? It's not really very responsible. There are a lot of other factors in here, but we can't add font downloads to, to the list of things that are preventing the user from interacting with a website. So this is a real problem. And the solution thus far has been this. Now, a lot of you might look at this page and say, mm, it's not so different. Well, some other people might look at straight up and down hash marks instead of proper quotation marks and say, eh, it's not so different. But you add all of these things together, all of these places where we're pairing away from the dynamic range of our design, from the sophistication and polish of the content that we're presenting, and that adds up to lost use. Because another thing that's been studied and shown is that well-set type increases retention and conversion. So there is a true cost in readership and commerce to poorly set type. This is something that we really have to keep in mind and, and look at this balance, because this typographic diversity is not something that is just on a wish list. It sells magazines. These fashion magazine covers, just a quick survey. We've got three different typefaces and at least seven weights on this fashion cover. Vogue, they've got at least nine different weights of type there in three different faces. GQ has two different typefaces and at least eight different weights from what I could get out of, out of studying that. So this isn't abnormal. It's not out of the ordinary. It's actually quite common for print pieces to use 10 to 15 or more different weights and variants of given typefaces in condensed, standard weights, extra thin, uh, extra, extra, uh, extra heavy. So you know, looking at Science Magazine, they've got eight plus different weights over here and as of last summer, they were using nine plus weights of Benton Sands on their website. So that may be a massive mistake and they could do a lot better, but it just goes to show you that this is, uh, I mean, it is a beautiful website. It's really well done. And I, I don't, I wouldn't want to pair that back if we didn't have to. So we have to try and think through that balance and what are the things that are preventing us from having that greater design freedom. And right now, that thing is performance. And when you think about the fact that nine weights translates to nine files, nine different files, because every single weight in a font 
or a variant, whether it's regular, italic, old italic, every single one of those is a separate file that has to be downloaded. Start counting when you realize that in one week, Google serves over 26 billion instances of open SANS across 20 million plus websites. So the disparity of that number, 26 billion, 20 million websites, what that tells us is there are many people going to websites, multiple websites, experiencing open SANS. We all have caches in our web browsers. So when we're going from one site to the next and seeing open SANS, we are looking at the browser cache first, or our browser's doing that for us because it's served through the same API. So all these people that are getting open SANS are loading cached files, but they're not all cached because I might use the 300 weight for text and somebody else might use the 400 weight, so that's different downloads. And what that means is if we could say turn all of that into a single font file that gets used and cached, imagine what the bandwidth savings would be and the load time advantage would be for all of us going to websites that are using Open Sans and for the person who's serving it. And by person, I mean Google. So it's not really a person, but they still pay a really big bill for 26 billion files. Those are very real cost implications. Cost of my time as a user, and whether or not I abandon your site and stop buying your products because those web fonts haven't shown up and I don't see any content. Well, something happened a year ago, just over a year. And, and this happened, you know, actually, it was three weeks before Ned Camp last year. And I mention that because there was a really fascinating and exciting thing that happened there. At A Type I, which is a big international uh, type and type, type design conference, um, Google, Microsoft, Apple, and Adobe got up on stage and introduced variable fonts. A variable font is something that was a complete revolution in mind shift in how a font is created, how a typeface is turned into a font. And I have to admit, I was pretty bowled over. I think I might have been a little bit more bowled over than a lot of the other people in the room, and I've talked a little bit about why. So when we look at something like this, where I got as expressive as I could possibly be with Esson, which is a beautiful typeface, and I used every possible different weight and variant I could um, throughout this page. You're only seeing a little bit of it. But that equates to 26 files, over 600K of data, 30% of the total page load to render chapter one of Moby Dick. Here it is set in uh, Lovett from CJ Dunn, a variable font. We separated the standard from the italics into two different files, 74K. And I had just as many variations in width and weight and slant as I had with 26 files in that previous example. And this is just an early beta of that typeface. That's not a fully, a fully baked one. It's going to get even better. Two dragons, one font. We've got performance, and we've got dynamic range. That's really pretty amazing. Here's another example. This is using Gimlet from David Jonathan Ross, where I've done kind of the same thing. We've got this in a single file. So it's got all of these different weights from this super heavy to much thinner. We've got an italic, we've got width, we've got all kinds of things that we can change all in that single file. And the most recent builds of it that I've seen from him weigh in around 32K. It's really pretty incredible stuff. So what is a variable font? This definition from John Hudson is a pretty good one. Um, rather than having, uh, if we say it's a 64 font superfamily, that means there are 64 different distinct files of compressed to wide to extended to extra light to heavy. All of these different variations would signify a separate file. We can now contain all of that in a single file. And it's a single file that can encompass technically a limitless number of axes of variation. 
So let's take a look at some of these in action. A few of these are more standardized ones like width and weight, but there are a few others that are fairly common. And the format actually allows for a type designer to introduce their own. So we had weight, we've got width, you can see the CSS above it, that's how it works. We've got slant, italicized. So that can, and notice that it's a separate glyph. I don't know if you saw that the lowercase a actually changes. I'll go back and show that again. So we've got weight, width, slant, watch for it, lowercase a, italic. So it supports glyph substitution. Optical size. Now this is really fascinating. Optical size, most people have never heard of. Because that was a practice that was in use when people <coughs> were making type out of metal. And as they were making physically smaller sizes of the type, they would expand on certain features in the bowls and these areas to increase readability out of physically smaller size. But when we converted everything to digital type and photo set type, all they did was look at one medium size form of that character and scale it. So that's what we've been dealing with for 30 plus years. We can now actually build this back in. So when we look at things on one of these, we can actually make it more legible. And that's really pretty amazing. So we're actually changing the physical characteristics of the type as it gets physically smaller on the screen. We also have grade. Grade is something that is going to have a profound impact on people with vision problems and people in low light scenarios. Because what we can do is subtly increase the contrast, the thickness of the stroke weights, without reflowing the text. So when there's low light, or if you have low vision, you can have an accessibility mode and make that text just slightly stronger without reflowing everything. It doesn't change the physical space in which those letters sit. Now bear in mind, these things are all based on what the designer designs. This is not interpolation that's being forced on it by the browser. So the designer still has the control. They can decide which axes they want to include. So if you have grade as an axis, it's because the designer meant it to be there. So you're not going to get fake bolds or forced italics. Those kinds of things can't happen with this format, but it does enable us to start thinking about typography and reacting to user context and needs in a way that we've never been able to do before. So here's an animation of it that I recorded out of the Axis Praxis website. So this is actually in a browser. All I was doing was playing with some sliders and letting the screen recorder run. Now, another thing that I wanted to stop and mention here about what happened a year ago in the MedCamp is the reason that I was so excited to come here last year was that literally the night before, Miles Maxfield from Apple sent me a message and let me know that the nightly build of Safari had already been uh, updated to include support for variable fonts. So when I was at this conference last year, this was the first place that had ever been demonstrated live in a shipping browser ever outside that initial introduction. And that was really pretty special. And I get to come here this year and talk to you about the progress and really you see how widely it's being supported already. So the thing that really strikes me about this is all of these capabilities that this gives us in order to have all of this expressive range in our typography, all of the performance benefits, all of the things that we can do for better accessibility. And I'm going to show you even more. If type is that voice of our words, that word, that just became a chorus. I totally butchered that. You really should have practiced it. <laughs> but we don't want to forget. I gave you a little bit of a, a hint with this. But it was also a lot funnier when I gave this for the first time and it was on the night of the last episode of season seven of Game of Thrones. You can't forget dragon number three. And in this case, this is actually opportunity. This is not a risk. So maybe it's not exactly an analog for what's going on, depending on which side you're on. But 
the opportunity here is with all of these capabilities for width and text grade um, and optical size is what we can do for different size screens. So this is uh, th those web fonts just made narrower. We're able to use media queries and, and change the type size, but what if we were actually to change the shape and size and, and, and space that the lettering actually exists in? So this is using Gimlet, and watch what happens as we get narrower. This got narrower, and we have more characters per line for more readable stanzas of text. We're able to have slightly better tuned headlines so that we can better word wrap with larger text. And I can show you some even better examples of that. When we look at this, uh, this one, this is again using Lovet, and you'll notice that it's not terrible here, but in German, where the words are a lot longer, look at all these awkward gaps. Because there's a couple of things going on. The words are a lot longer, and hyphenation dictionaries on the web for German are not as good. So from what I've been told, many people uh, working in websites in German would not use hyphenation. In English, we might. But look what happens when we make the text slightly narrower. We have 10 characters more per line. It's still perfectly readable. Many of you, if you weren't looking carefully, you might not have even noticed in terms of the shape of the characters. But look what happened over here. It's a much nicer rag. It's a much more elegant solution without compromising the readability. So as more and more people are consuming more and more content on smaller screens, we can actually create an even better experience. And again, like with that lower light scenario, if you watch carefully, see how it just made the text stand out just a little bit more? We increased the grade of the text just a little bit so that it has stronger contrast, people with lower vision, or if you're in a lower light scenario, you'll have better readability. All of that with a single file download. So this one was using Amstelvar, uh, which was uh, designed by David Burlow from Titan Network. Uh, it's a bit of an experimental one, but it actually can do some, some pretty nice things for, for text, just as an experiment to see how this would, how this would look. That's three dragons. With one thing, with one development, one file, we're able to sort performance, design freedom, and address usability in a way we've never been able to before. So, where can we use it? Well, it turns out, if you have iOS 11, you can use it. It's supported in every browser that's shipping on iOS. It's also supported in the latest versions of Chrome on Mac and Windows and in, on Safari in High Sierra. So we do have to qualify that. You have to be in the latest version of the Mac OS. Um, it has shipped in High Sierra and Windows 10. It has shipped in support in uh, Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop. And it is in development in Edge and supported behind a flag in Firefox. So we're within a few months of having it working in every shipping browser that supports web files. That's pretty remarkable for one year. So that's a whole lot of really cool stuff and a whole lot of really good reasons that you might want to take advantage of this technology. Um, more and more type designers are getting on board. Um, Adobe and Microsoft and Google are all working on converting their existing type libraries into the variable font format. But I think this really is still only telling part of the story. Because this is where it can get really exciting, especially with Drupal. So I'm going to take a brief look, a little tour through some big media sites. And I'm going to keep flipping through some of these. And I'm willing to wager that you won't be able to identify more than maybe two, maybe three. This is the top 10 news sites in the world. It's the Guardian, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, a few others. But the problem is, what we've done with our design systems on the web is we have optimized for anything. We've created these systems that can, that can house titles of any length. Uh, we, this an image is present or it's not. Um, we have geared towards the anything at the expense of everything. We have all system and no soul. And I think that's a real shame because we've changed the way we think about design and the way we apply it 
to the work that we're doing. And I gotta tell you, those monks did not settle for good enough. They did not think, nah, that's okay. No, they made sure it was right. They made sure it was done well, that it was done to the level to which it deserved to be done. And I had a conversation on Twitter with someone recently, and I was really disappointed at this person's reaction, because this person is responsible for design at a very large media organization. And there was this element of throwing up the hands when it gets outside the specific realm of graphic design. So not caring about user experience, not caring about performance, not caring about any of these other factors other than what does it look like to me, said the designer, on my 27-inch screen with my high-speed data connection without any device testing. As I gotta tell you, design is all of these things together because none of them exist in isolation. As I mentioned earlier, until it is on that screen, the design does not exist. The website does not exist. The app does not exist. So typography is the thing that touches all of them. Typography is design. It is communication. It is an intentional act. We make conscious decisions about what typefaces we use to amplify the meaning. Look at that design. That design tells you where to look. It tells you what the most important story is. It tells you what you should look at and what you should look at next. And very sophisticated use of type and type and image that guides you through the design. That is graphic design. That's what it's for. That's its power. And we have constrained it to this tiny little box of creating the theme at the beginning. We used to have this process where an author writes something, an editor edits it, and the designer lays it out. And the designer is making choices based on the meaning of that content to infer and amplify that based on how those titles are typed, typeset and how those images are arranged. And we changed that because we had to create a system. I'm not finding fault with this. I still work in a content management system. We all do, that's why we're here. We do have to have a design system, but we've been forced to work in a way that makes one design system that gets applied to every piece of content. And I think we have an opportunity with variable fonts to start to think about how we might change that. So a few years ago, a designer did try and break out of this mold of sameness and Jason Santamaria started art directing each of his blog posts. And they were really beautiful. Every one of them was different. Every one of them was tailored to the content that was being written. It all made sense. It was really gorgeous. It amplified the meaning. And it was entirely unsustainable when he gave up. And I don't really blame him. Because he wasn't getting paid to art direct his blog post. He was getting paid to do a day job. And this was something he was doing for fun. ProPublic, on the other hand, is getting paid to do this work, and they do beautiful work. But what happens when they create this layout for this story? They go into their content management system, and they hit a button, and that button blows away all of the styles that are inherent in that content management system's theme, and they put in customized HTML and CSS for every one of those stories. So it's beautiful but unsustainable, unless you have an organization that is entirely focused on basically creating an entire coding, an entirely new responsive design for every single story. And that is not a sustainable practice. There's no way it can be. But we could do better if we actually built access into the content management system to take advantage of these variable fonts. So what might that look like? Well, this is just a mock-up, but imagine all of these different examples of dim text. And we wanted to be able to achieve these different variations without loading lots of different fonts. We might not want to just say, I highlight this text and make it bold. How about how bold? What if we could highlight some text and access, access all of these axes of variation? So if we, if we could actually highlight it and have it pop up a layer, and for every different axis that we can change, 
have a little slider or some other UI control that allows us to see what that difference is. And there's another thing that I didn't mention that the designer can still build in these sort of predefined named instances of light condensed that will give you the numeric equivalent in the variation. So you can still look at the, the points at which the designer says, I intended it to look great here, 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 and here. But it still is going to work well somewhere slightly in the middle. So you can just pick one from here, change the weight a little bit to kind of fit the emphasis you're looking for, and then go ahead and publish. And you could just simply write out in the CMS a little snippet of CSS and store it with that story and have it just work, kind of like this. So this is a screenshot from a Drupal website that I'm about to show you in action that's using Gimlet and Output Sans from Dave Jonathan Ross. And those are both variable fonts. And so using the magic of the paragraphs module, we hit edit, we go into that particular line of text crank the weight slider all the way out, save it, and there we go. So if you want to be able to give some editorial design control to somebody on the site, make a separate role for that, don't give this to everyone, <laughs> we could actually build in a design role in Drupal and typeset our headlines, typeset our pull quotes, create truly unique experiences without having to write a line of code. I think this is where we take Drupal from being simply a platform to put content out to a design platform to publish true works of art. Really polished content. Imagine what you'd be able to do at Vogue, at Vanity Fair, at Harper's Bazaar, Atlantic Monthly, where they have a time-honored tradition of incredible typography in their print publications that is almost entirely lost once you get to their website. You might see the recognizable typeface in a headline and nothing more. The entire elegance of that form of printed communication is lost. And it doesn't have to be. And we could do it in Drupal before anybody else. Because it's already built, and if you ask me for it, I'll give it to you. <laughs> so, a slider that's already built? Um, all that is is a range slider. It's an HTML5 element. So I'll be honest, I cheated a little bit and I made a twig template. We made some of those yesterday yeah. in the workshop. And all I did was I made a new twig template for uh, a, new, a, num uh, a numerical range input. So instead of a text box, just said slider. That's it. Now, it would be better if you had a module for that. But all it's doing is writing out of a min and a max value that is being applied in the style sheet, and it just writes out a tiny little style sheet for each line of that text. And so every time you edit it, you just change those values, hit save, and you've got you've got your new your new look. So I'm gonna mirror the screen here and I can actually show you this in action. Because it's way more fun when you do live experimental technology. So here's that sample website. And you can see I've got a few different instances of variable fonts on here. And this little chunk here, I also make use of that on the home page as a little highlight there. Now, this is not the most elegant of demos. It's not exactly a design piece that I would submit to Communication Arts Awards. But this piece here, displayed at this size, is the exact same component that was displayed on the other screen, two times the size. I'm just using viewport units. That's a totally supported measurement unit that's based on the width of the screen. And everything else is sized relative inside that. So if I go and edit this, so we'll go into this blog post, and we'll edit. I know that that's down at the bottom. Here we go. Um, this is using paragraphs with uh, the preview option under the experimental, feature, uh, experimental display features. Um, it could use a little bit of work, but it's actually a pretty nice way for the author to see what they're, what they're looking at. Um, so 
I think that we maybe want to de-emphasize world because it's prob it's a good blog post. I wouldn't say it's the world's best blog post. So we'll maybe kind of de-emphasize that a little bit. We'll just bring the weight down. And on this one, two, it's really wide. It's really, so we'll make, we'll make, maybe we'll just change the width on this one and bring the weight down a little bit and just save that. Let's roll down to the bottom here. It's got a little bit of a different look now. Now, I think it would probably be better if I actually changed the weight of the word one here, because it'll be a little bit more noticeable for you. But bear in mind, this is using, the, like the one thing that I did was customize that one twig template. That's it. So this is everything else here. I took me like an hour or two to make this in paragraphs. So just imagine if you put a little bit of time into thinking through, I would like to create a widget builder to typeset interesting pull quotes. Think about that for like a, as a publishing capability to give people that option to make this really beautifully thought out, almost infographic style pull quote in the middle of an article. I mean, you'd really start to get into a much higher level of editorial design. So I will go in here and we'll edit the, this line because we, we do want to emphasize the fact that it's really just one font that was being used there. That's got a little more presence. So all of this is stuff that you can put in the hands of hopefully a very design aware user. Um, but it's a tremendous amount of flexibility and power that is all still being delivered with the exact same asset. So I set this up to pull in a couple of different variable fonts. You can still have a design system that takes advantage of more than one. So if you have, well, like say you've got two, that might still only be 100K. And that's less than what we're loading now to have six or seven or eight different files. Instead, we get thousands of permutations. And we get all of these other benefits. So if we go and we take a look here at what's going on, we'll inspect this word. And so what I, what I did in the output of this is here's the contents of the field word one, right above it, I just wrote out a little style sheet. That's it. And this is totally legit. There's nothing wrong with this from uh, a sort of an appropriate front end work workflow. Um, it, if you were to actually build it into a module, given that this is Drupal, you could actually take all those styles and do a, a more drupal -y way of actually having them um, aggregated and, uh, and compressed just for use on a page that's requiring it. I mean, if you used a, a Drupal module to do like an add Drupal add CSS, then you could write these things out and store them in a, a more performant way. This is just coming out with the rendering of the content. But it's really that simple. Font family, the at font face declaration is the same as any other that you would be writing. And then font variation settings. And any axis that you want to alter, you simply mention it and supply the value. Is the way that you, um, that you get the variable fonts the same as with the other Google fonts where you, yes. you call it in and you just find out which ones are variables? So, uh, so there's, this is still a bit of a chicken and egg scenario. Uh, uh, so what I can show you is uh, the at font face declaration is exactly the same. So if you're hosting yourself, it is no different. You just at font face, the source, the file name, that's it. And then you have access to it in your, in your CSS. Uh, but I want to show you a website where you can go experiment. It's a website called Axis Praxis, A-X-I-S-P-R-A-X-I-S.org. So a uh, super guy named Lawrence Penny put this together. And what he did was create a website where you can test variable fonts. And so a lot of the ones that are available now, zoom in a little bit here, um, are all listed here. People have given them to him to include here so that you can try them out. And he set up this great intro page that tells you exactly what to do and it shows in a bunch of different variations. So 
if we want to play with this in action, I just click in here, so I'm in the header element, and I would like to change that to, see, we'll go with uh, Amstelvar, one of the ones that I was using, and you'll notice there's a ton of different sliders for this one. So there's all kinds of different axes of variation that you can play around with. And in this site, you can see exactly what they do. So weight is pretty easy. Width, so you can make it wider or narrower. But you also have all of these other really cool things you can play with. So the X opaque, X transparent, you have to play with these a little bit to see what they do. These get into some fairly nerdy type terms, but we can increase grade so we can make it more readable in low light. We can also do things, play with the descenders. So we can really alter the tonality and the character of it. Um, another one that is really great for that is uh, called Dunbar. So this is one from CJ Dunn. This looks like a, a, a fairly standard, kind of modern looking sans serif. There's nothing really too crazy about that. And if you were to lower the weight on it a little bit, you could easily imagine that as a substitute for something like avant-garde, something along those lines. But watch what you can do if you'd really like to accentuate this, maybe make it really big and use it for display headings, but give it a little bit more of an art deco feel. Oops, not that one. Lower the X height. So I think that completely changes the whole character of the typeface, whole feeling of it, simply by making the height of the lowercase letters smaller. Or, if you want to bump it all the way out in the other direction, you can make it super tall. And again, gives a completely different feel. And then a lot, that, along with the weight variation, again, completely different feel. That could be straight out of the 1920s. And then you crank this up, and you can all of a sudden fast forward 70, 80, 90 years. It's really remarkable. And so these kinds of things are not necessarily about what we might think of as the standard design variations that we want in a typeface. This actually gives a whole tonality change to it. This one down here, uh, Decovar, the word playground is set in. I want to show you this one because one of the things about uh, accessibility needs is dealing with things, uh, issues that people have uh, like dyslexia. So one of the things that makes text easier to read for people with dyslexia is greater differentiation between letter forms. Now, Kathy, I'm sure, talked a lot about this, and I'm really bummed that I didn't get to see her Specifically talk. this you talked about for how we like to So, <laughs> she so one of the things there. Yes. So watch what happens to the terminals, the end of the letter forms. We've gone back to a fairly standard letter form there, but we could also flare them a little bit and give them a little bit of a serif. We can play around with the weight a little bit. Again, it, this, is a this one's a little bit crazy. This is not really meant to be a production typeface. It's meant to show off the capabilities. But let's bring this back and start to think through making it a little bit more of a slab. So again, greater differentiation that you can achieve with a single typeface. It's entirely conceivable that you could do something like have Museo and Museo slab in one file. And you can also decide if you want it to enable it to be something that, like this one, lets you get everything in between. Or you can choose, do you want really defined serifs or just very, very subtle ones? Or it can be more of a bit flip. The, text, the, the type designer has that freedom to say they're either on or off. So imagine a typeface like Museo that has a beautiful slab serif with it. And you can have a toggle that's going to set them on or off. And then all the other width and weight variations are yours to play with. The kind of design freedom that you'd have with that would be really astonishing. So it's going to take a little time for type designers to kind of figure it out, for all of us to play around with it on the web and see the kinds of things that we can do, the kinds of things that we can do to make the web a better place for more people based on bandwidth, 
better accessibility in developing countries because it's going to be less download for them. Um, we can address accessibility for low vision, for, uh, for dyslexia, for all kinds of things. So this is really, to me, one of the most significant developments on the web, maybe ever. I mean, responsive design is pretty big, but this eclipses it by a pretty wide margin because it's not just about responsiveness to screen size, it's about responsiveness to the reader. And that's really remarkable. Very powerful thing. So go to Access Praxis, play around with stuff, search on GitHub for variable fonts. You'll find a bunch that you can download yourself and play around with. Um, I'm also going to show you a link to a sample page on my website where there's a bunch of pages of mostly Moby Dick set in different co uh, combinations of web fonts and variable fonts with a link to a GitHub repository so you can download them yourself. And I'm hosting all the web fonts, so you can just point there. The designers have given you permission to do that. You can play around with this code and, and see, see it for yourself. Um, another little trick to keep in mind, see you've got this little box over here. If you have a variable font that you've downloaded or purchased from someone, you have one to play with, and you're not sure what all the axes of variation are, drag it on that box. It's going to get loaded into this page, and it will show you all of the values and sliders that are available. It's really amazing. Lawrence has done an incredible job with this. And also, make note over here, if you select any of these, like I selected Amstel VAR, and there should be, I wonder if you removed it. Yeah, I have to. Um, there's supposed to be a little info link. Nuts. Okay, I'm going to have to ask him about this. Um, because he, at one point, had an info link that would give you the, like where this typeface is from, and oftentimes a link to download it. Um, but start with GitHub, search for variable fonts. Uh, may, may, maybe. I'm just going to fall back on he moved it. So uh, select over there. If there's a little eye, click on that. It's going to tell you a whole bunch of interesting things here, oftentimes where to get it and who created it. So there's a link right here to go and get Amstelvar from GitHub. Um, Adobe has a version of Source Sans and a couple other ones that are out there that you can download. Um, also, uh, if you look me up on Medium, just at Jay Pomentel, uh, I published a roundup of resources uh, recently from a bunch of conference talks and things like that. Uh, it's just called One Year In, um, and I will tweet a link to that with the conference hashtag. Um, so that should give you an awful lot of things to play with. I know we're starting to run out of time, so I'm going to come back here, press this, and go here, and say thank you. We do have a few minutes for questions, and I'll be happy to answer them. I just do want to point out, um, I don't have this version of the slides up yet, but I will shortly. But if you go to this bit.ly link, jprwtvfdc, that is a page that has a number of different videos of different versions of this talk, links to code downloads, slides, um, all of that stuff is there. And if you just want to get straight to the demo, bit.ly slash jpvf demos will take you straight to the demo page so you can download that. Um, and I do just want to say a thank you again to CJ Dunn and David Jonathan Ross for providing me the typefaces to use in a lot of these demos. So, questions? Go ahead. You know, um, this is really exciting to me because I have a little girl and I have a little boy and I have a little and uh, she has a background, a big, huge background in that. And, and at the, um, an event of art I went to in Boston in March, she showed us how the CSS, how you can do a lot of the layout. So CSS grid. Yes. CSS grid. You can do a lot of the layouts that magazines do, which made my boss very happy. But I hadn't had a chance to really utilize it yet. It's a lot to learn. And um, so this, with that, 
is exciting, and why don't you two team up and do, um, uh, do, a, sh do a road show? Uh, it's, it's funny you should say that, actually, because we kind of did that once this you year. Um, at UX Burlington back in June, um, she gave that talk, and then I gave this one right after. And I had to say, it was pretty awesome. It's a powerful combination to see those two, yeah. those two, fit, those two ideas together. Uh, we've talked a lot about that. And, like a um, workshop. It's, kind of it's just really about graphic design for the web. Yeah. And bringing in real typography, um, all of these different kinds of uh, expansion of our, of our design vocabulary, coupled with these layout ideas. I know Aaron behind you uh, has been experimenting a bit with CSS Grid on a project. And we're really, uh, it's pretty widely supported, but there's still some gotchas when you're dealing with other browsers. So all of these things are evolutionary. Um, the nice thing is, oh, that I forgot to mention is you can use app supports in CSS to scope this only to browsers that will actually understand it. Um, so you could actually put this in production now. Um, and if you check can I use, you um, can actually see where it's supported and where it's coming. And so you can open up variable fonts on can I use, and that was something that um, it was actually Jen Simmons was the one that prompted me to, to actually fix that earlier this year. So that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> follow up on, on the supports approach. Uh, so performance wise, how do you uh, not load the fallback? So is that done with? The question, uh, the question is about uh, dealing with the performance implication of trying to support both the fallback standard fonts and getting the good ones. Uh, this is where the nature of CSS comes to the rescue. Uh, CSS is by nature a blocking request. So nothing is going to get rendered until the whole CSS document is loaded and parsed and understood by the browser. So those fonts will never be loaded you can still have them all in the same at font face declaration, but if the at supports chunk trumps any reference to the non-variable fonts, they will never be loaded by the browser. You can have them in at font face, but until they get referenced in CSS, they don't get it. It doesn't trigger a download. So, so that's that's what an instance where the blocking nature of CSS loading is actually an advantage. It's a pretty minor thing, but the, uh, the paragraphs uh, preview feature that you mentioned. Um, what is that available? Is that like in the dev field of paragraphs? No, no, it's in the it's in the so full release of it. Um, there's um, you, the options that you have for display when you've added a paragraph in the content type. You have on the form display. You can choose open, closed, or preview. Okay, cool. And and so it's not. It's not perfect, yeah. but you'd have to make sure that you bring the CSS into your admin theme that you intend to use on the public side. Uh, so there's a few considerations there, but um, but it's it's very possible to make this. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we have reached time. Look at that, <laughs> right on time. Thank you very much. I'll now push the red button again. <laughs>